I want to frame with you uh, at a high level what's going on in, in uh, across the country in healthcare and get down to what that means for you as anesthesiologists and, and us as UH providers. And you see, though we do miracles every day, uh, medicine today still has preventable harm as at least the third leading cause of death in America. It's kind of shocking, that kind of is shocking. Sadly, we don't actually know the epidemiology of how many people die needlessly. The estimates vary uh, widely, but it's at least the over 250,000 a year. And if you add in not controlling COPD, not controlling diabetes, smoking, misdiagnosis, it is by far the leading cause of death. Uh, medicine today, though our HCAP scores are good, what our HCAP scores reflect is somewhere between three and 10, depending on which unit, maybe two and 10 or four and 10 patients leave their interaction with healthcare, leave the hospital saying, I wasn't respected, I wasn't listened to, and I'm scared because I don't know what to do when I leave. And if any of you ever read discharge instructions, you'd be scared, oh, scared also. The heart failure and hip replacement look exactly the same. Uh, and medicine today squanders a third of every dollar we spend on things that either don't get people well or a result of failures or uh, in, in inefficiencies. And every payer of health care the federal government, state government, municipalities, employers like UH, and us as people, many of us who have high deductible plans, our healthcare spending is going up more than our revenue. And that's not a sustainable <coughs> model. Every payer solution to that is they take a variety of mechanisms, but what they say is we're tired of trying to control quality and reduce variation. We are now putting risk on you as the providers for managing how much you spend on patients and you either choose to manage that or you don't. Uh, we at UH in most places didn't necessarily have the infrastructure to do that because when you're on an RVU model it's not designed to keep people healthy at home rather than healing the hospital. And let me just give you an example of what, what that means kind of this paradigm shift. And I'll share with you a story of Helen. Helen is a 65-year-old woman employed by one of our local em employers who happened to be on our board and has heart failure, had a valve replacement, uh, still leaks some. Helen was admitted 35 times last year for heart failure. And every time she was admitted, the part worked brilliantly. She showed up in the ED, they afterloaded her, they diureased her, she got admitted to the ICU, same thing. She got sent out, but came back in. In the old model, where success is having people heal in hospital, every one of those admissions was counted as a win. They filled our beds, right? The, the hospital execs and board members saying, that's really, really good. From Helen's perspective, from the employer's perspective, from society's perspective, and I would say from ours as humanist physicians or clinicians, every one of those is a defect. Right, your total $1.2 million bill is almost entirely preventable if we coordinated care, because Helen got sent out every time with no PCP follow-up, not knowing how to self-manage. So it doesn't surprise us that Helen comes back a lot. So how does that happen in the midst of you doing miracles every day? That the innovation, the care that you give is breathtaking. Well, I want to explore with you what I think underlies this, and it isn't just economic incentives. They're important. It's the stories that you tell, that we tell ourselves. Before we get into stories, though, I'd like you to write the words, I will down or think about them, because I hope at the end, this isn't just a lecture to honor the Garrett family's gift. It's a lecture that stimulates to do something to drive the value for the people that you serve. So stories. Stories are the most potent tool for change in the world because 
they define how you act. Whether you see yourself as powerful or powerless, you speak up or you stay silent. Whether you see others as collaborators or competitors, you choose to work together or not. You change the story and you change everything. Stories like JFK, I want a man on, on the moon. We, stories like the free market, stories like <coughs> liberal democracy and, and civil rights, all of these ideas were what fundamentally changed society. I'll put forth that we have three narratives that we tell every day that are holding us back from keeping Helen healthy at home rather than healing in hospital. The first narrative, stop believing that harm is inevitable. Start believing harm is preventable. My own journey in that, I'm an anesthesia intensivist, began in 2001 on a snowy night in a dark corner of the PICU when this little girl, Josie, who looked hauntingly like my daughter and was born days apart, was taken off of life support and died in her mother's arms. She had been burned and was healing, was actually supposed to go home that day, but a catheter infection sacrificed her. And at the time, we've all been trained that catheter infections, like other harms, are just the cost of doing business. That when you care for sick or older young people, sometimes little girls like Josie are going to die. And she did. And she was in good company at the time, if you could believe it. These catheter infections, one frankly small part of the safety issue, killed more people than breast or prostate cancer. Repeat that. Catheter infections, more people dead than breast or prostate cancer. But we didn't imbue it as harm. We just said, stuff happens. Well, her mother came to me and said, could you tell me this won't happen to my other daughters? And I started giving her the spiel that many of us would give about all the great things we're doing to improve quality and safety. And I had this moral moment and I said, you know, her mom Sorrell, I can't tell you it's better because frankly, it's not. Our rates are sky high. We don't have a good program. And we'll put something together. She then said something that changed my life. She said, then Peter, what are you going to do about that? And in that moment, I knew we needed to change the narrative. So we declared a goal of zero infections. And at the time, my colleagues at Hopkins thought I was off my rock with because we were at the CDC average, right? And I said, okay, averages when people aren't doing what they're supposed to stall progress, right? We knew we were complying with best practices maybe 30, 40% of the time. So to say your average is literally gonna keep you from making progress, but that's most of the quality benchmarks in this country until you optimize the system, benchmarks aren't holding you back. We will be zero. We made a checklist of best practices, and this applies to so many things you did. We went to the CDC guideline, guideline that's scholarly, a guideline that was elegant, a guideline that's near useless for me as a bedside clinician, because it is 150 pages long, it recommends 95 things, and doesn't prioritize which thing is most important. It just gives you a list of, here as I rate the evidence, right? I said, who the heck would have ever thought that that's a useful output for clinicians, right? I, I can't do 95 things, I'm lucky if I can do three or five, and prioritize it, which ones are most important to do. So we went through and said, okay, let's take that guideline and make a checklist of the things that have the strongest evidence, so the lowest number needed to treat for the people who know ClinEpi, and the lowest risks or hurdles to use, like anticoagulation has some good efficacy, but not likely to be very practical in surgical critical care in most ICUs, so we didn't put that on. It made a simple five item checklist. We also knew that one of the main reasons clinicians don't follow guidelines isn't because we don't want to, it's ambiguity. And I would challenge you to read almost any guideline that's put forth and ask someone to say, like an engineer, after I read this, am I clear who's supposed to do what, where, when, and how? We never are that specific. We use really vague language. And in some cases, if we know operating, in an operating model, what that means, that's great. If we don't have a clear operating model or checklist in our brain, for the, the residents or faculty, I would say a classic example of that is this notion of what do you do when someone sack, sack drops and across America or the world, I check the airways intact. 
Does that something you might say as a response? Hypoxia check airways intact. As you know, there's no airway and check airway attack test. Right, that is probably 30 different things or 10 different things that each of you have to do. And you all probably have a different mental model of what that means. And so it's not surprisingly so many airway things are flails because we, don't, we all have this <coughs> amb ambiguous way of, way of I'm, I'm managing it. We need to revive it. Third thing we did is we encouraged doctors and nurses to work together. We got the nurses to say, if the doctors don't follow a checklist, you are empowered to stop the takeoff. And that, literally almost caused World War III. Uh, <laughs> strikingly, not because anybody debated the evidence, which I could have accepted, but more because of ego and power and politics. And it was highlighted how if we don't address culture, we won't make progress. You see, the doctors pulled me aside and said, Peter, there's no way a nurse can question me in public. It makes me look like I don't know something. And I said, okay, the last I knew your name wasn't Jesus or Yahweh or God. <laughs> like, you don't know things, it's okay. The nurses said, there's no way I'm gonna speak up, Peter, I'll get my head bit off. Sad reality is they often did. And so we pulled everyone together and said, is it tenable that we harm patients here? And everyone said, no, can't do that. And we said, and do you agree that this that checklist is evidence-based that we ought to do it all the time? Yes, we agree with that, Peter. I said, okay, then let me be very clear. We have permission to forget to wash our hands or to put on a cap. We're human, we're going to. But we don't have permission to needlessly put patients at risk. So if you forget, I get it, we're all human, but nurse or student or whoever, if they see you, they will speak up and you will go back and fix that defect. And nurses, I know you're worried about your, getting your head bit off, so let me be very clear. Docs, we just agreed this is our policy. So if you give the nurses flat, nurses page me anytime or day or night, I, you will be supported. Like we just agreed on this, ego is not gonna get in the way of harming patients. Now, when it was framed as a collective goal, I wasn't paged. Rates went from, if you could imagine how horrific they used to be, 11 per thousand catheter days, which a hospital now I would say should be shut down if they're that high, to zero. And we spread this program state by state across the US, these infection rates are now down by 90% across the country. Think like curing a size of a problem the size of breast or prostate cancer, and it wasn't that, that I cured it, the cure was in the providers, they just weren't telling the right narrative. And so we partnered with some anthropologists and sociologists and said, what happened that led them to get to zero? And there were some technical things. They needed to have a checklist they needed to make it easy to use the checklist so the supplies had to be available. They had to have some transparent reporting of performance measures and some department chair or hospital leader had to ask about what are you doing about performance. So there was a management system that was needed. But that wasn't the secret sauce. When we dug deeper and said what led to this change, the anthropologist and the sociologist who were interviewing people said, Peter, when you spoke with them, you can immediately see in their eyes what they believed in their heart. The difference is they all said we started telling a new story. The old story was, oh, these infections are inevitable, and I'm just a fill in the blank. A resident, a fellow, a CRNA, attending, a charge nurse. It's probably the most destructive language in the world is I'm just a. And they accepted it. And when they got to zero, those leaders said, these are preventable and I am powerful to do something about that. And when they got that new narrative, they didn't need someone giving them a checklist. They figured it out, it's not rocket science because they had that new narrative to say, we're gonna do what it takes to solve this iteratively to get to zero. And so we dug into some of that literature and said, what leads to zero, to that new narrative, to people telling new stories? Turns out there's a pretty robust social science and political science literature that is decades old of what leads to new narratives. First part is someone believing that zero is possible, or I can get to some goal. And the classic story of that is Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile uh, as a medical student at Oxford in 1954. And prior to that, you may remember 
that leading scientists for since the first Olympia, 2,000 years prior, said it is physiologically impossible to run that fast. You will die uh, trying. You can't deliver enough oxygen to your muscles. Well, he didn't die, and that story is well chronicled. But what's often not known is that next year, this 2,000-year-old record, 12 people broke it. The year after that, 156 people broke it. And now if you saw the last New York Marathon, the guy ran a four-minute pace for the whole 26 miles, and high school kids throughout America are running four-minute miles. So what changed in 1954? Not doping, not evolution, not new sneakers, simply their belief. Bannister freed up everyone for that four-minute impossibility, and my folks, that's what we need to do for defects in care. Second part that leads to these new narratives, shockingly, isn't you're on an RVU model or I take nickel out of your pay if your quality's not good. And that's not to say we don't need to align those. What leads to those new narratives besides believing is belonging to a peer learning committee, a peer learning committee, where I can say, wow, you guys are doing something really neat over in the cardiac ORs, or uh, what could I learn from that? And the classic example of that is from Mary Poppins. How many of you have seen Mary Poppins? Almost everyone. So you probably remember that a very prominent feature of the play or the movie are the birds chirping when she's caring for the children, when she's skipping in the park, when she's flying down. And that's because London was full of two types of melodious songbirds, the red robins and the blue tits. And they thrived in London because they used to peck through the tops of the milk containers that were left on people's stoops. They sucked the fat out of the top of them and they were really plump, really happy birds who were singing a lot. But then the milk companies changed from cardboard and steeple to aluminum and flat. And both birds are equally smart. And a few of both birds learned the new way of pecking. But the red robins are extinct in London today, and the blue tits thrive. And the only difference is the red robins are solitary birds. They have their stoop or their corner. We call it our division, our area in the OR, our department, our hospital. And that wisdom never disseminated. The blue tits are flocking birds. They fly in a V, strong and proud. So the wisdom quickly disseminated and they impl implemented it and shared. And if I think about these challenges we're having in healthcare for harm, for waste, even just within UH, somewhere somebody has an idea or a practice that is knocking it out of the park. The question is, do we have the structure and or the culture to be more like the bluebirds than the red robins. And the reality is many times we don't. Second narrative is stop believing that value is not your responsibility and start believing that it's all of our responsibility. You see, when Helen showed up, and there's tons of examples of Helen in healthcare, the part worked brilliantly. The system failed. And everyone in their part thought they were doing their job. They, they did what they were supposed to do, but nobody owned the system of saying, okay, how are we driving value? Surely 35 emissions, maybe we can kind of pull or do something about it and saying well, what's going on, but we're just on this cycle that we nobody owned value. And by value, what we mean is the quality of care plus the experience of that care over the patient's annual total cost of care. Why annual total cost of care? Because that's what every payer looks at, and that's what we're now rewarded or, or penalized for in all these pay payment systems. They look up what they spend in a year. If it's below what the threshold is, we get some of that. If it's uh, above that, we give something back. Some of these, like the bundles, are 90-day episodes. Some in our ACO are a full year. But fundamentally, this is the equation that we're now going on. So those, each of those Helen readmissions are waste. We're going to be penalized them from, as we should. So how do we begin to think about defects in the value? A key part of this is we have to start opening our lenses to work as a system. A system is a set of parts interacting to achieve a goal. We haven't uh, really delivered on that value proposition yet. And these organizations that are highly, highly effective at reducing defects, they're called high reliability organizations, like an aircraft carrier, 
they fundamentally do three things and three things only. Number one, everybody commits that they have two jobs. The job they were hired to do and a job to add more value every day. So they see value as my responsibility, but I don't come and say, oh, it's the quality officer or the hospital quality nurse whose job is to make things things better. There's a hunger to say, yes, I get the job I was hired to do, but all of us have to say, how do we make it better every day? Everybody's job. Second thing they do is they, what I call reduce mindless variation, but augment mindful variation. Mindful variation is variation that exists because we just didn't time, take the time to make a protocol, or more often because, frankly, my ego. I want to do it this way because of my power or status, because I'm uh, the attending physician, I'm a division director, I'm a chair, I can do whatever I want. Uh, in a safe organization, there's no room for mindless variation. On the other hand, we need to augment mindful variation. That's variation when I have a hunch or a hypothesis that this patient's different and I need to deviate from the protocol. And we see those all the time. We don't vary enough in those cases, but that mindful variation imparts an obligation that you learn if your hunch is correct so that others could benefit from that. And we rarely, very rarely, do the learning. We, we, we vary, but it happens almost random, and so there's not any wisdom generated. And they balance those two very, very carefully. Healthcare is significantly understandardized. We still have a ton of variation. Just Ted and I were looking at who uses monitored beds, for example, right? A really precious resource across the system. And it's almost random who goes in there, right? There's not a lot of uh, standard protocols. You can, if you need your short monitored beds, you can go take half the people off of it and probably no decrement or increase in risk to, uh, um, at all because we haven't standardized much. I don't know the percent of our patients that are on ERAS, some of these hospitals that are really standardizing their anesthesia protocols are doing 90, 94% of all their anesthetics are done by no narcotics with ERAS and shorter length of stay. But these opportunities for that abound. The third thing these high reliability organizations do is they break boundaries. That is, they connect horizontally so divisions learn from each other and vertically so that upstream and downstream people are connected. So they would never think of sending someone out of the hospital without a PCP follow. Because to give you an example, prior to our work in the bundles that you've probably heard about, which are, we're paid now for the 90-day total cost of care, not the annual. Any guess of what percent of our patients and, and patients nationally, nationally had a PCP follow-up when they left the hospital schedule? 2%. Now, you figure you're sick enough to come to a hospital, you probably should get plugged back into some provider. 2% of our patients, we're now up to like 56, 57% across our system still needs to be higher but it, it just was no on anybody's mindset that's like it wasn't my job i did my job in here and they i didn't see that connection let, let me give an example of what everybody's role in this thing really looks like i've shared this story with mark before i i visited an aircraft carrier to learn about what they really do and how they manage and truth be told I was saying how hard it is in an academic health system to manage like this when you have residents. And the admiral quickly shut me up and said, son, stop your whining and start managing. You know, <laughs> we have, our average age is 18 year old. We turn over the entire crew every six months because you can't stay out at sea that long. But we have protocols for everything. And we train people to those protocols and everybody has a role. So he was sharing with me those three principles. And standing next to him was a gentleman sweeping the deck. And I asked him what job he does. Now, as you may know, on the power hierarchy, that guy sweeping the deck is way below the atom, right? Just like the people who clean the OR rooms or the anesthesia techs are way below Mark or Dan Simon. But on the safety hierarchy, they're exactly equal. Because if there's a hammer on that flight deck, it comes down, it hits, they blow up, they all die. So when I asked that gentleman what job he did, I was blown away. He stopped what he was doing. He stood up tall and proud. He looked me in the eye and said, sir, I help planes take off and land safely to serve the mission of the United States. I said, wow. 
That is somebody connected to purpose. I left there and walked now in several hundred hospitals in America, including ours, and asked an EVS worker, what job do you do? Same power dynamics, same safety dynamics, as you know, because you can get MRSA or CDF. And what answer do you think we got? Not standing up looking tall and proud, but rather looking away almost shameful and said, I clean the rooms. I said, no, you don't. You prevent infections. That's your job. You keep people safe from harm from infections. I asked someone at a call center, what job do you do? They said, I answer the phones. I said, no, 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 you are a healer. People call you scared and suffering, and you connect them to, to needed care. And we haven't managed, amazingly, because it's the most humane of all disciplines, healthcare in a way that connects everyone to those purposes. I, I, I have this great story. I was sharing this with Dr. Padinar, one of the nephrologists, who said, you know, Peter, I mean, if you have ESRD, the number one thing you can do to save their lives is get them into a transplant. You know, it, it's, it is. But, and the dialysis techs spend three hours a day, three times a week with the patients. The, the patients trust them, but we've never engaged them to talk to patients about referring them to dialysis. I said, well, why not? Let's, let's put a little, some training together for them. I suspect they would like it. The patients trust them. Let's see if we can do it. So we worked with some of the nephrologists, scripted them. They did this nefer referrals to transplant up 45%. That's why you're probably doing in part by so many more kidney transplants. Simply engaging a staff who was passionate about it, was working on this, but had never been thought as part of the care team was I'm a dialysis tech. So the opportunities for this are just amazing. Now, I, because I have a bit of a checklist fetish, I would imagine we started making what's a checklist for defects in, in, in value? Defects in value. We grouped them into three domains. Defects in helping people stay well. That is annual wellness exams, cancer screenings, immunizations. We were at, for example, our UH employees, 25% last year of women who should have a mammogram got a mammogram. We've been pushing for this. We're up to like 65% uh, now. We're still quite low on colon cancer screening. So for your own health, make sure we do these things because we've got, we've got to start living this narrative ourselves. But for those of you in the pre-op center, when you see people, if we don't have an annual wellness, we're deploying new technology to make these gaps visible. So as you're seeing people, it'll be very clear to say, oh, you didn't have your mammogram or you didn't have a colonoscopy and having people uh, work to get this. Defects in helping people get well. So for any chronic disease, there's defects in this chain of, and we'll, let's take that diabetes, for example. Is it diagnosed? 40% of diabetics are undiagnosed. They have a high glucose or A1C somewhere in their lab. Same thing with hypertensive. You see them all, but nobody says, I own value. I'm gonna plug you into care because this is likely a diagnosis of diabetes. Half are on the recommended therapy. As you know, the therapies have changed with the uh, newer drugs. Is their symptoms controlled? So whose job is to titrate it, either to increase the dose or add new drugs, or importantly, to make sure we address the social determinants that maybe they're not controlled because they can't afford it or they don't, can't get a ride to the hospital. When we look at diabetes nationally, 11% have their A1C, their lipids, and their glucose control, 11%. And not surprisingly, 95% have avoidable ED and hospital visits because that upstream chain, it's all part of a system, haven't been addressed. But who owns that? Because right now, nobody owns that. We're not even you know, thinking of the lens of eliminating these defects. And then much of what we do, how do we manage an acute condition? I mentioned about are we coordinating care with primary care? We're aggressively, both at ED discharge and hospital discharging, working to plug people into primary care. Is what we're recommending appropriate? And you all know this, because you know we have centers of excellence for a number of things, bariatric surgery, joints, any guess why employers love center of excellence? They really do one thing to drive value. They don't operate 30% of the time because it's pretty clear in almost every procedure that's looked at, when you have rigid appropriateness criteria, 30% of the time you don't need to have what's been done. And that's been looked at surgical on, it's been looked at PCI, it's been looked at joints, it's literally, it's just anywhere that the signal has gone. And, that, and that's not to say you don't get excellent quality and outcomes. The payers, those want to save that money of not being operated on for 30% of the time. Is the site of service optimal? 
as you know, there is this massive migration of moving things from a high cost setting like CMC to a lower cost setting or to home. And yet we still do procedures here that could be done a heck of a lot cheaper somewhere else. In the past, when we were paid fee for service, we just got paid for it. Now we will lose contracts. We are losing contracts if someone says, hey, why am I paying you this rate when this can be done in an ASC? And we should aggressively begin to, to think strategically about what cases are done in an ASC because things like simple cataract are pretty hard to justify that you're still doing them in an expensive OR or a lot of procedures. But whose job is it to begin to uh, migrate that? And are they going to a high, the high value provider? We're looking at volumes of procedures in, in our system. Some of you may have seen, we looked at the volume outcome relationship, that is mean how many a hospital does, much of your great care, and how many a surgeon does, strongly predicts outcomes. We had one of the hospitals in our system was doing four or five esophagectomies a year with like a 40, 50% mortality rate, saying, okay, I get it, but can't continue, right? It's not fair to the patient, it's just not good care. But there's a lot of those things where we're doing across the, the, the system things that we can't keep afford to doing to, uh, in, in, every, in, in every place. The last narrative that I'd love to explore with you is stop believing that financial incentives alone are gonna solve the healthcare problem and start believing that the secret of healthcare quality or value is love. And by love, I don't mean something ethereal and uh, marriage. By love, I mean the biologic response to love. The mechanism that Barbara Friedrichsen a psychologist at UNC who studies the biology of love, she literally looks at what makes oxytocin spike, you know, the cuddler nursing hormone. And what she found is that biologically, love is lived in micro moments of positive connection between two people or more. The idea is I feel warm towards you, you feel warm towards me, and we create energy. Love is a hand on a worried patient saying, I'm going to stay with you or putting someone to sleep. Love is an arm around a colleague who just made a mistake and is feeling really bad. Love is saying to that EBS worker, hey, thanks for, pre for preventing infections. The wounds look really, really clean. Love is a respectful smile to a homeless person. You see, this big change that we're trying to embark on, and believe me, is the one trying to navigate it is scary as hell because it's not like there's a roadmap and we're <laughs> kind of trying to weave these pieces together. But the big change is just the sum of hundreds of small changes. And every one of them is made possible by a microphone. And if you think about some of your most meaningful memories as a clinician, I guarantee you it wasn't some brilliant diagnosis or some great airway management. It's a micro moment, right? And that's what we take and what's the beauty of this is this kind of culture that is gonna drive value is the same kind of culture that makes work joyful for us and it's the same culture that makes patient experience mine. It's all underlined by love or micro moments. The beauty of these micro moments is that they are infectious, literally infectious. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the science of uh, Nick Christakis wrote a book called Connected, also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. He was the one who showed if you put a fit person on a team, everyone else on that team is more likely to be fit. In other words, you literally infect these behaviors. But not just that team, the effect goes three networks deep. The dose response goes down, but literally people who you don't even know go down, and it goes from like a 40% impact to 20 to nine, three networks deep. It works the other way though, you put a jerk or someone who sours a team, and we've all probably been on that, and it literally sours not just that team, but the next ring and the next ring. But you put someone who creates micro moments, because we are the culture, we all choose to create culture or break culture every day, and you can infect those micro moments every day. I've learned about this uh, back in Baltimore on a Sunday morning, just before Valentine's Day, that it was snowing out, and as an ICU attending, I suspect like here, I would stop at Dunkin' Donuts to buy bagels or donuts for the staff who worked at night. And I was in line, and the Dunkin' Donuts where I go is around the corner from a homeless shelter and a block away from a bail bonds. And so it's full of homeless people 
and people going about their job. Uh, cops, nurses, Sunday school teachers. And so I'm in line and there's a homeless couple in front of me and they were dirty, but deeply in love. And they were holding hands and the guy was reaching in his pocket to see if he had enough change to buy the heart-shaped donut with pink frosting that they release at Valentine's Day. Some of you may have eaten this before. Hopefully not. <laughs> Since they're trying to stay well. And they were a nickel short. And so the guy turns around and says, hey, Peter, could you... Shut up, Peter. Could you shut up, Peter? Yeah, And I said, you know, I'm getting an order, order for work. Uh, just order breakfast. I'll treat you for breakfast. Go ahead and put up whatever you want on, on tap. So they go up to order, and the cashier must have had an implicit or maybe explicit bias and said, you can't order that food. You don't have any money. And the guy made a scene and said, no, the guy behind me said he would buy me breakfast. He said he would buy me breakfast. And I said, yes, I'll buy him breakfast. They can get whatever they want. Well, there was a nurse standing next to me who said, well, that's a cool idea. I turned to the homeless person next to her and said, can I buy you breakfast? There was a Sunday school teacher on the other side of me who said, hey, can I buy you breakfast? There was a cop behind me who did the same thing. And this love cascade literally went seven people deep in 30 seconds. It was probably one of the most moving experiences you could probably tell I ever had in my life. I was really quite blown away. And I was walking out, the couple were eating their breakfast and said, hey, could we speak with you for a minute? And I said, sure. And they said, you know, we're not nobodies. We just made some bad decisions in our life. They said, yeah, you and uh, all of us. But we're going to get our act together. He said, you know. And I said, I believe so much you will. Do me a favor. When you do, buy somebody else breakfast. So fast forward to June and Sunday morning. I'm schlepping into Dunkin' Donuts to buy bagels. And the cashier says, hey, Doc, some guy left a note for you. It, written in a little crinkled piece of paper and pencil was, I bought somebody breakfast today. So my friends, your challenge is to say, how are we within the UH anesthesia team gonna start to tell some new narratives? That we're gonna stop believing harm is inevitable and start believing it's preventable. We're gonna stop believing that value is not my responsibility and start believing it's all of our responsibility. And we're gonna stop believing that economic incentives alone will solve this problem and start infecting love. So I thank you and I'm happy to take questions or hear what your I will statements are because you're not going to get a free lunch out of this. You're going to have to get some more. <laughs> <time. laughs> able to make improvements based on studies or listening to your lecture, etc. But this hospital in the upper management level has never promoted stuff like stay well. So in Cleveland Clinic, they have a system whereby the insurance company representative calls you and says, you haven't taken your mammogram. If you don't get your mammogram within a certain time, your premium will go up. So that is a way that you know it's communicated. Secondly, we are talking about the spread of infection within the hospital. Our uh, some of the personnel who have not been taught that they cannot wear gloves all over the hospital are pressing uh, elevator buttons with the same gloves, opening the handles. Now this is not a clinical side that we can go to my chairman. But then who in the administration will, should we communicate with, and how do we do it? Yeah, so two great um, questions. Um, and the employee plan now rolls up to me, and you're spot on. Like when I started to look at some of our mammogram rates, they were atrocious. We are, and you'll see at this new benefit design, aggressively, aggressively changing uh, that. We've already, to give you an example, done a campaign where we send out emails or texts to people who haven't had mammograms and we arrange scheduling now, they could automatically schedule it. We um, reached out to, we had 4,000 employees who had an ED visit or a hospitalization, but no primary care visit, it's very ridiculous. So we now say, hey, here's you need to go get a primary care doctor. In our new benefit design, we, um, 
one of the quirkeries of the Obamacare Act was it pays for a quote an annual wellness but if you go for an annual wellness and discuss any disease it's no longer an annual wellness and it's not paid for so it incentivizes people I mean on the one hand it's a it's a well-intended policy that wasn't thought about in a broad enough context that you uh, doesn't get paid for so many people say well I don't go because I have to tie you know I want to talk about other things so we now in our benefit design will have three free visits to a primary care doc regardless of what your disease is because we want to keep people you know help people get well and encourage primary care use rather than um, we are working on incentives for our to changing our premiums our current platform sadly isn't sophisticated enough to do that it requires they, some way we have to be able to monitor whether you have it but we will be doing um, weight programs and smoking that will impact your premiums in 2021 so we're we're behind it won't be as stick or as as that, that approach is going to be more supporting and offering things but there will be uh, incentives we will also be launching um, discounted gym memberships this year for our employees so a lot we're, we're we have a lot to do but there's a lot going on in that space for your point about the gloves I would say two things when you look at these ultra safe organizations part of everybody improves value is when we see things we say something right and I know it's a comfortable but it's not respectful to say oh do you know when you wear this or you touch that you might be a risk infection it's not going to solve everything but at least we give feedback Robin Strosaker the CMO or now COO I would just email her and uh, there they would you know be all over that and, you, and you're right I think there's been you've been here for a while uh, the gap or the bridge between senior and leaders and what goes on in departments I think is way it's huge and as you can probably tell from many of these things we're trying to mirror that and more importantly push accountability and responsibility as close to the bedside as we could because that's where the wisdom of how to fix these defects lie when we talk about wellness for ourselves I think one of the things that we find an impediment to progress and it's true for everybody we work with is we don't get sick time if you're sick and you call it we lose a vacation day. Um, before where I worked before you had an automatic number of days per month of sick time so that you didn't have to come to work February so I worked I worked on the first day of Zoster because right. I nobody would let me go home and so the system <clears throat> works against us wellness wise by being unwilling to acknowledge that there are days we probably shouldn't come to work and protect everybody and penalize us for making that personal choice do you see any foreseeable way that we could have six days a month and if we don't use them we get something back for being good at and not being sick because I got to bank I get up to state employees I banked all my unused six days rolled it into a lifetime health care benefit from the state of New York. And we have nothing that would reward us for taking care of ourselves and not affecting patients because we are not allowed to take care Yeah, so great. Uh, I actually didn't know that because the other employees, non-physicians do it. I mean, a lot of AMCs. The did. nurses and stuff have to take a long time. Yeah. So um, it's in, in essence, the same system. I will uh, take that on for a discussion. That would be lovely. Thank you for your help. <laughs> Other. Uh, thanks very much, by the way. That was an awesome talk. What do you think it is about medicine that um, puts us so far behind other HROs and yeah, other great uh, military you know, aircraft carrier? Why are we so reluctant and slow and sluggish to change narratives the way other organizations have? Yeah, great points. And I, know I haven't written about this, but maybe I should because I think when I go back to narratives, if you look at our history, all those other higher HROs grew out of an engineering mindset. I mean, they're developed by engineers who think, you know, starting at the end game and work backwards, right? I want to design a system that planes don't crash. And I get the pilots and the plane, but the mindset is different. They, and they, you know, anticipate things. Medicine grew out of an apprenticeship, right? Not at all out of engineering. It grew out of this individualistic mindset where I get one-on-one -on -one training with the mentor, I, who's the guru who makes me a guru right I mean so we're system blind I mean like you know like um, and so I think we're not trained to think in systems 
we uh, don't embrace real systems engineering, you know, that, that would design something. I like just walk into an OR or an ICU and look at the wires, like the layout. I mean, like a, an engineer would cringe, like, like, are you kidding me? But, you know, like this, this is really what it's like in, in, in healthcare. So I think that's the mindset. And the more we could embrace, you know, these uh, engineering approaches, that, and, and even if you think about our whole biomedical research enterprise, it's all feed forward rather than feedback like in engineering. What I mean is fundamentally research is, is Coke better than Pepsi, right? And, and hopefully if we find which one we like, we put a protocol in and hope people get the right thing, right? It, it, it is, it obviously there's basic, we find therapies that work, but often we think our job is to publish the paper or get a grant, not to then put into practice that new evidence that we found. Right? An engineering mindset, and in many ways, the Clabsy work we did was very much of an outcomes or an engineering mindset. We started with the goal of zero infection. Right? That's, we, unfortunately, we don't do it that often in healthcare, and said, we're gonna package a program that gets to zero, and I'm gonna give up knowing which part of the program was most important, because what I mostly care about is the zero infections, and I won't bore you with the methods, but there's an, this economic term called value of information that says, is it worth no, knowing this. So when we first published our study, m many people perhaps justifiably criticized me and said, Peter, how do you know your checklist couldn't be five items or six items, or four items or six items? How do you know five was right? And th this is flawed. So said, you're spot on. I don't know if five is right, but I don't really give a damn. Because for me to study that in a robust way, you know, do, do, doing randomized trials of different correlations would have been 10 years. Like every year, more people die than breast or prostate cancer. Unless that checklist item was costly in, to the patient or in dollars or took a lot of time, it's not worth knowing that, right? So uh, you do four steps instead of five, big deal. But you save 30,000 lives a year, sure doesn't seem it's worth studying it for, for, for 10 years. But that, that's a different narrative than, than so I, my sense is it boils down to one group grew out of an engineering mindset that aims for zero harm and sees defects. We grew out of an apprenticeship that sees the, the art largely over the, um, the science. I want to hear some of your I will statements before I leave. Like, when I think about uh, issues of expanding ERAS, you know, SSI, by the way, I don't know what your SSI rates were the exact same thing. When we started this, we had like a 35% SSI rate, and the message was, oh, of course, when you operate in the colon, you're going to have it, right? I think literally, and now it's like one and a half or two percent, simply because people worked as a team. They made they made uh, protocols. Post-op respiratory complications, huge issues. Whether we go or you're, I don't know how far we are around using ERAS and spreading out standard uh, protocol for that. Uh, use of ICUs or monitor beds. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things using the pre-op testing center for uh, you know really adding value and uh, helping us the overall well-being of our patients. So, any ideas about things that, is that as a department we might be able to do? So, uh, in the area that I control, we have gone over to disposable blood pressure cups, and we are now going to disposable. EKG electrodes, so very cross contamination. That's one of them. Yeah, that, so that's a big thing, especially in cardiac, the reduction in uh, external wound infections from that. Any other I will statements? I love your story about the enzyme on the deck of the aircraft here. Once before, I hear some person say it's wonderful, but it's important. And so I want to spread that and help, I will help people realize that they are. Landings, things are landing and taking off safely. Like coming in and being healthy, getting the care they need, and being healthy. You know, that it's, it's yeah, that's great. It's not hitting the right. floor. And the beauty part of it is most people want to be connected to purpose. We just haven't invited them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, like that dialysis tech, no, no extra cost. That they're jazzed about. Wow, we actually help people get transplanted. We help particularly say like they're sitting there. You know, and so whether it's. The, the techs of the EVS workers, you know, inviting people in to be the part of this collaborative team. How about any of the residents? Anything you guys are going to do differently? I 
guess all I have to think about. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I got one more great. Sorry, it's not night well. And that's just, you know, having worked here for you know almost a decade, um, some of the policies that come down from the administration see just seem kind of arbitrary. So we just went through the whole beard cover thing. And that comes from you know a recommendation that has a list of other recommendations on it, and we but we chose one to follow and not the others. And so it seems kind of arbitrary that somebody in administration gets, you know, being the bond about something and we have to you know, comply with the one when it's not evidence based, and you know, so it seems like unsupported is uh, people working here that you know, kind of at the whim of what the flavor of the month is. Yeah, so great uh, point, and I can feel your pain. <laughs> one of the principles that we're trying to do, uh, I am really trying to drive down that comes from high reliability is this concept of deference to expertise, in other words, involve the local workers in solving the problems don't come up from on high because you almost always get it wrong. In other words, if you're too far away from what the real work is, it's hard to policy. I don't know the details of that policy. Sometimes those come from, come because there's a JCO requirement that's a state of business. Other times, you're right, they're, they're, they, there's not enough forums to get, or to be like that blue tit to say, well, let's get a group together to see what's wise so that we end up uh, really doing something wise. Uh, I'll uh, shoot an email and find out what the issue with that is. I, I, I um, don't know, but I, I think that is um, an opportunity for all of us, though, if those things come out to say, hey, you know, I get we need to reduce infection risk. Could we put together a form of clinicians to give input into what these policies are? And I suspect that would be well received. All right, well, I thank you.